Hello, this is Edith Neumeyer, and I'm the author of the book, The Mystery of Adam. Today, I want to talk about Ephesians. Now, what I'm talking about today um, is not related to my book, and it's not related to gender equality. Actually, it is, huh? Because I'm going to talk about the temple and what could be not more egalitarian than the temple. That is very true, isn't it? All right. I hope you understand that part because today I'm going to talk, going to talk again about the temple. And um, I came across some really good verses in Ephesians. And so I want to share those with you. And Paul was talking about the temple in Ephesians. He was talking about bringing together, and that was that's in Ephesians 2, bringing together Jews and Gentiles into one and tearing down the wall between them. So I'm going to be looking at, again, chapter 2, um, starting with, 13, okay, 13. So I have said so many times that in within um, the temple, which is really symbolic for the church, Jesus said that I am the temple, but he extends his temple to include, when he died, to include the church because we are one with him, okay? And because we're one with him, we also become one body with him. And therefore, his temple extends. And I will bring up a quote on that in a little bit about how he is branching out. And now this temple becomes larger than just, um, you know, Jesus. So, but let's look at Ephesians first, okay? So Jesus, um, it says, oh, wait a minute here, Ephesians 2.13, it says, but now in Jesus Christ, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that here's talking about the Gentiles. And for he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barriers of the dividing wall. So here he's talking about both of them becoming one, Jews and Gentiles. And you can read this in the previous uh, verses. Okay. And he's bringing them together into one, uh, what they call, he calls commonwealth. Okay. Commonwealth. It's commonwealth of Israel. So he's calling both Israel. So Israel includes the Gentiles and the Jewish believers. Okay? Don't be fooled. It's not just all of Israel. I mean, not all of Jewish. Uh, again, Jews are descendants of Judah. So why is he only mentoring Judah here? Because at that time, um, the other um, tribes were dispersed under the Gentiles, okay? So only Judah was a, a recognized, Judah and Benjamin were rec was a recognized tribe still in existence um, at the time of Paul. That's why he's using Jews here. Israel is the overall, the 12 tribes. But I have said in my, my, in my previous videos that after Solomon, the kingdom that David established was divided into Israel and Judah. And Judah only contained Judah and Benjamin. And the rest of the 10 tribes, they were under Ephraim. And they uh, called themselves Israel. And they were now divided. And Israel rebelled right away and was dispersed under all the Gentiles, never returning, never returning to the promised land. Because God 
divorced them. And then many years later, he did the same thing with Judah. He dispersed Judah, and Judah was sent into captivity. Many years later, some of the tribes of Judah returned to the promised land. Not all of them. Okay, not all of them. Some still stayed dispersed. So when Judah returned with some of Benjamin, and uh, they were called the Jews. So when, when Paul was writing this, he is talking about the Jews. And why did the Jews return? Because God gave um, Abraham a promise that from one of his descendants, Messiah would come. So Judah had to be um, secured in a sense. So they could come back and bring forth Messiah. But at this point, there's no more need for bringing forth Messiah that was already accomplished. And so today, the Jews, it's very hard to trace back your descendants to a specific tribe. Okay? Very, very difficult. As a matter of fact, any all the other Israelites, Hebrews, if you call them, they're so dispersed in the world that you cannot distinct, uh, you know, you, you cannot distinctly say who is actually a, a descendant, descendant from the Israelites. Uh, only a Jew could actually say that, and that is even hard today. During Jesus' time, they still could do that. They still could say, okay, this Jesus came from the tribe of, or lineage of David. Okay, because they still, still kept very uh, good uh, record. But today, it's, it's almost impossible to trace your lineage back to a certain, you know, let's say for to David. It's very hard. So if anybody will come today and says, well, I'm from the lineage of David, uh, very, be hard, very hard to prove. Okay, so just saying a little bit about uh, what Paul is addressing here. So Paul is addressing uh, the two groups. He's actually talking about the whole of Israel, which are believers, believers of Messiah. Okay, that's the significance about Israel. It is not necessarily the significance of, um, you know, your biological, the biological descendant. That's not very important when you're looking at this Israel. Uh, Israel is symbolic for all the believers of Messiah. That's just what it is. And of course, then you have the Jews, descendants of Judah, who had the kingly lineage through whom, who came the Messiah. So let's continue a little bit. So then, since I said that much, so he, for he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barriers of the div dividing wall. And this dividing wall, um, uh, let me look that one up. It's my commentary. It's this dividing wall or the barriers. Nope, it doesn't say anything. But anyways, this dividing wall, we can also see in the temple. There was a dividing wall between the Gentiles, the court of the Gentiles, and of the Jewish court. No Gentile could come into the Jewish court. Matter of fact, there's also a dividing wall between the, the, the Jewish men and the Jewish women's court. So um, in that temple, um, that symbolic temple, the first temple, the second temple, there were all these walls between Gentiles, Jews, and men and women, okay? And in Galatians, Paul again addresses that division, and he says, no, there is no longer Jews um, or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. And this is what they're talking about here. These walls, they're actually were there in the temple. So he tears down the wall of division by abolishing it, abolishing in his flesh 
the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained. Let's see, contained ordinances that in himself he might make the two into one new man, into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. So in other words, he's combining them into what? One body. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in, our, in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Okay. See, in those days, Paul really had to stand firm against what you would call these traditional Jews that were believers. And I think it was most of the apostles. They struggled very strongly to hold on to these traditions and to keep the Gentiles separate from the Jews. They were saying, well, we are better, we are Jews, and we can't intermingle with the Gentiles. But Paul always held on to that belief that God is bringing both of them together. Okay? So now I'm reading 18, verse 18. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling place of God in the spirit. So here is saying that now finally God is starting to build his true temple. Now God instructed the Israelites to build the tabernacle out of a tent in the wilderness. And that was symbolic for this temple that he's was planning to build, okay? He did not let them know what this temple was going to be. It was always secretive. Why? Because, of course, Satan wanted to destroy that temple. He wanted to just destroy Messiah. He did not want Messiah to even, uh, you know, come into this world. So if he would know, have known that there's more to this temple than just the Messiah, then, of course, he would have tried to destroy that even more. So God was pretty secretive about this. So that tabernacle was only symbolic. So then, when these Israelites, of course, came into the promised land, David was probably one of the first ones that had this idea to build a permanent place for God. And God, um, I think he told them, he tried to tell them, if you read the prophets, many times he told them, hey, I don't want a, a, a house for myself. Okay, I don't want a temple. But David still insisted, and, and if you want to uh, listen to the uh, videos I made, you know, look, you know, go back and, and, and listen to them. But he wanted a place for God. And God says, no, you're not going to build that place for me. One of your descendants will do it. And he described the descendants. But David assumed it was one of his sons, Solomon, that would build the temple. But of course, he misunderstood or misinterpreted. It was not going to be. Um, Solomon, he was, go, he was talking about Messiah. Messiah would come and would build the temple of God. And Paul recognized that exactly 
in Ephesians and said, this is the plan of God. Right now, he is building his temple and his temple includes living stones. It doesn't include dead stones, okay? Rocks, but living stones. Each member is a living stone in that temple and God right now is building it. And he has been building that temple from the beginning of time, okay? The foundation has been laid with all the believers in the Old Testament. And now he is continuing this building with all the believers of the Gentiles, okay? And that's something that, of course, the Jews didn't understand because, oh, we are better than everybody else. God has chosen us, but God has not chosen them. God has chosen them to fulfill a certain purpose. And that purpose was his plan. And his plan was always to bring forth the Messiah first and then his bride, okay? Or his temple or his body, whatever you want to call it. So that when we read these verses, we Christians should know what God, God's plan is. We should not be fooled, should we? But why are we fooled? Why are we so excited about God's temple, the third temple, being rebuilt? Because so many Christians are just so, you know, oh man, this third temple is going to be rebuilt. Yes, I understand. Some people say, well, once it, the, the third temple is rebuilt, then, um, well, the abomination of desolation can happen, which, um, you know, they believe is something the, that will be put in the temple um, that makes it unholy. But here's what I'm saying. Here's what I'm saying. If we believe that Jesus is building the temple right now and that this temple is the church. And when I'm talking about the church, I'm talking about every believer, no matter what denomination they believe uh, that you are in. You are a believer. Okay, you are a follower of Jesus Christ then you belong to that temple. You belong to the church. You belong to the bride of Messiah. If you belong to that bride, then you are the temple, okay? You are, in a sense, the real temple. I don't want to say the third temple, but you are, in a sense, the real temple. Now, let's read where this desolation thing comes up since I mentioned it. Um, it's not, I think I have it on my computer. Matthew 24, 19. Um, actually, let's start with, let's see what we're going to start with. 16, 15. I'm going backwards. Let's see, what am I, 17. I have started away 14, maybe. Let's start 14. And his gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So this is a sign of the end. Okay, that's why people are so excited. Oh, the temple is going to be rebuilt. Well, he has been rebuilding the temple from the time he, he died on the cross. So, but this is talking about the end. Then, so when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Okay. Here says the sacrilegious object that causes desecration standing in the holy place. So it's a sacrilegious object. That is an interesting one. Sacrilegious object. So a lot of people believe that this applies to 
not necessarily the temple, but what's going to be in the temple. And I'm saying this can just as much apply to the temple. Because if we believe, or if Paul says that we are the temple, the church is the temple, then anything else, like building the third temple in, let's say, on the holy place, is already sacrilegious. Okay? It's already abomination. It's already abomination. You don't have to have anything inside, but just the building alone would be an abomination that causes desolation. Okay? It's a it's a abomination that will call that will will um um arouse God's wrath. Okay? Because he's been talking to them, he's been destroying the second temple, and you know the Jews have not listened. Even after 2,000 years, he's coming after them. He is punishing them. The Holocaust happened. You know, they have been, so many times they have been um, persecuted and killed. And, you know, culmination of the Holocaust. That's the culmination. No, we are going to blame others and not take responsibility why God is punishing us. Okay? Um and so then they're building the temple. That would absolutely be an abomination. They would finally scream into God's face saying, hey, we absolutely don't need you. We have our own religion and that's it. Okay, that is going to be it. So yeah, absolutely, that would be an abomination. And if people cannot see that, um, I don't understand. I think any Christian that doesn't understand that the temple right now, God's temple is right now being built and that the church is that temple. Okay. Here's another verse where God says, I remember I said the one that he told David, and you have to look that one up yourself. Um, and that is the, I don't need that one. Uh, where is it? Hmm, I lost it. Zechariah 6. Let me look that up. Uh, Zechariah 6. I'm going to look it up. Let's see, 6. And we're going to look up 6, 12. There we go. 612 says, tell him this. Tell him this is what the Lord Almighty says. Here is a man whose name is Branch, and he will branch out from his place and build the temple of the Lord. It is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he will be clothed with majesty and will sit and rule his throne, and he will be a priest on his throne, and there will be harmony between the two. Who is he talking about? Who is this branch? Well, most people believe that this branch is Messiah. Why is this Messiah? Well, simply because Messiah will be the one who combines the priestly office and the ruling office. Now, the ruling um, office was with the, the, the tribe of Judah. Out of tribe of Judah was supposed to come the king. Messiah. Okay. The um, Levites had temporary priestly offices, but that was temporary. That was temporary for the covenant, the Mount Sinai covenant. But that Mount Sinai covenant does not exist anymore. They broke that covenant. It's very easy. You can go, I think, in Jeremiah, where God um, divorced Israel for breaking that covenant because they were uh, whoring around with idols and so he broke the covenant so now because that covenant is broken a new covenant has to be put in place and that new covenant is actually already in in place and that goes all the way back to melchizedek okay 
So when you read in Hebrews that Messiah is according to the order of Melchizedek, it's telling you that he is a priest according to the Mel Melchizedek order, but not to the Levite order. So he can be from the lineage of Judah, and he's not from the lineage of Aaron because he doesn't need to be from the uh, um, because his uh, lineage comes from Judah and of course from the uh, lineage of uh, Mel Melchizedek. So that's how we know this is about Messiah who combines both the offices. Okay, and so. Jews and, and Christians know that this word branch being used here in uh, Zechariah 6.12 is speaking about Messiah. So here he is saying, so when did God say this? Who did he tell this? Well, when they came back from the Babylonian, the Jews came back from the Babylonian captivity. Um, and only the Jews came back. All the other tribes did not come back. Okay, into the promised land. When the Jews came back, um, then, um, what did I want to say? So now I forgot. Yes, I'm getting old. So anyways, let's go back to the branch. So this branch um, is Messiah. And yeah, I can say because this branch comes from Judah, Judah was allowed to come back, okay, into the promised land. So Messiah could be born. And so that branch will, oh, now I know. They came back from the Babylonian captivity, and they wanted to build another temple. So that was called the second temple. And when they started to build that branch, God again told Zechariah that really the branch will build the true temple. Okay, so that's what this is. Zechariah was one of the people that was in charge of returning um, to the promised land and to rebuild the temple. But God told him right away, no, you know what? The branch will really build the temple. Of course, they, they continued anyways, but God, after Jesus Christ, after Messiah died, um, 70 years later, in 70 AD, uh, God finally also destroyed that second temple because it was not needed anymore, okay? And what was more significant is that every stone was torn down from that temple. Every stone was torn down. Okay, you cannot find the original place anymore. Some people say the holy place, you know, the Temple Mound, that was the place, but I don't believe so. I don't believe so because I believe that was Fort Antonia, which was the Roman fort, right? That was right next to the temple. Okay, but we don't know. We really don't know. And God's intention was really for us to not know because he's saying, hey, right now I'm building my temple and you guys are supposed to be uh, focusing on my temple, not on the temple that you want to build. Okay, so why are many Christians even excited, you know, about having, about having this temple being rebuilt? I don't understand because I believe it would be an abomination. It would be an absolute abomination to rebuild um, that physical temple. And God will be extremely, extremely, um, you know, extremely upset. And that's why he said in um, Matthew that if you see this abomination standing in the holy place, run for the hills. That's basically what he said run for the hills again read in matthew 24 and i believe it's maybe 16 or 17 um because i will be, i believe that it will unleash god's wrath again now the jews had a lot uh, of things happening to them but 
you know, once they build that temple, oh my goodness, God will be so upset, so upset that he's saying, if you are a believer during that time and you live in Israel, you better run, you better run. Because if you don't run, you will be hit with the wrath of God. Now, I also believe that possibly by the time that wrath will be poured out, of course, we will be gone. And the Bible talks about Jacob's trouble. The Old Testament talks about Jacob's trouble. And that's exactly what it is. It is God unleashing the wrath on the unbelieving Jews. That, you know, he has tried so hard and they are still stubborn. They have rebuilt, you know, the temple and they're still performing these sacrifices. And, and, and what, war, I mean, worse things can they do to sacrifice when, when Jesus has already fulfilled things? I mean, that is like, oh my goodness, it's screaming in the face of God. But yes, I want to finish up today. This is, again, one of these long um, videos. But I just wanted to share, I came across that and I just wanted to share this. Because I, it, it just is really, uh, I have a hard time understanding why Christians would be so happy. You know, I at one time I was really interested in this third temple and, you know, rebuilding this third temple. And the reason why I was interested is, again, because once the temple is being rebuilt, then, you know, the end is near. The end is near. And, and I'm realizing right now, yeah, the end will be near because God will be so upset, will be so upset. I mean, I was at that time not really in full... Uh, you know, I didn't realize fully that we are the temple. We are the temple. That, that Messiah is building the temple right now. And if the Jews build the third temple, they will scream in God's face and they will reject him. I mean, they will openly and actively reject him. Okay. And any, any um, Christian who will support this temple project, I also believe will be going under that wrath. I mean, God will just, I don't think that person can be a Christian anyways. I mean, if you're a Christian, I would think you would know about Ephesians very well and all the other um, scripture, you know, scriptural verses, and you know who the true temple is, okay? So yeah, we are the temple, okay? Um, and, and keep that in mind because there's so many other verses that I don't uh, have time to talk about. Like for instance, when the Antichrist, some people say that the Antichrist will set, put himself in the temple. Well, if you say that, you know, the Antichrist could sit literally in temple, but he could also set himself into the real temple of God, into the church. And then it's a different story. But I'm not going to go there today. Uh, that's a different story. Matter of fact, I have actually addressed that one. And I may just address it in my next video. Today, I will finish up. Please read these verses. I will put them down in the uh, section below. Description section, I think it's called. Um, and you can read these verses. And hey, let me know what you think. Um, give me some feedback. Uh, I love feedback. So give me feedback and I will see maybe next time I can actually talk about the verse in, I believe in Thessalonians, when it says about um, that Antichrist will sit in the temple of God. So anyways, if I can find it. some Sometimes these, these verses are made up. So anyways, I will finish up today and I will... Talk to you later.